recording. Let's get started. Okay, hi everyone. I am going to uh, start out right away. I am, a, I almost said disorganized, but I am not disorganized. I'm, uh, I'm super tired. <laughs> I'm worn out. I'm exhausted. Uh, barely trying to keep up. The uh, the family is uh, is weathering the hardship of not having school going on. Okay, but it's a lot of work for both of us trying to homeschool our kids. And my wife, in particular, is a an elementary school teacher, and she's really pouring her heart heart into taking care of uh, not just our kids, but her elementary school kids, so uh, kindergartners, no less. So imagine trying to take an online class as a kindergartner. Anyway, um, it is starting to wear on us all a little bit. So uh, I, I almost said disorganized, but that's not the right word. I'm, I'm perfectly well organized. I am, uh, I'm tired and discombobulated is a better word to, to use about it. But let me, uh, let me get things fired up here. I, I do have a plan for today. Uh, after I get our, ah, there we go. I need to open the course in Canvas. Sorry, I was not quite ready for that. Uh, there we go. All right, so let me share the screen. And by the way, I'm I'm trying out the uh, the bearded look. I usually grow a beard in the winter, as as uh, as as good of a beard I can as I can grow. It's it's not much, but. Uh, I'm, I'm giving it a shot here for the spring just because since I can't get a haircut, <laughs> I figure I may as well go with, uh, with the, uh, the, the bottom half of my face as unkempt as the top half of my head. So I, I don't know, we'll, you all can comment in the chat about that if you wanna um, let, your, let your opinions, uh, <laughs> so he said go all the way, all right. Uh, or I could go all the way and just shave it all off too. That's another solution. <laughs> Um, let's get the, the screen share going. Let's get class going. I want to value everybody's time. And the weirdest thing happens. I'm still working Zoom out. I got everybody's little windows there. I want to see the chat window because the chat is working. There's the chat window. Cool. All right. Uh, so just really quick to talk about this week. I haven't posted the second half module. We've been doing a theme a week but for the second half of the class, we really start moving into uh, two chapters some weeks, but not as much additional reading every time. So th there's more intensity on the Whelan readings, less intensity on you know, three or four articles in addition to a Whelan reading. We've been doing that quite a bit, less of that going into the rest of the quarter. Uh, I'm gonna keep everyone's workload in mind. And I, I recognize that uh, if I'm feeling this way, I'm sure some students in class are feeling a little uh, discombobulated or overwhelmed by some of the, the workload. My main challenge is keeping up with grading. And so I wanna make sure I find a way to get you feedback uh, fast. And that's not happening as quick as I'd like it to happen, but I'm still working on that um, and still get through the material in a, in a timely fashion. So what I'm trying to say is that in the next three weeks, we might have a little bit uh, less in terms of additional articles or extra readings in addition to the uh, to the, the basics from Whelan. So we might be a little more sticking to text. Anyway, uh, the nice thing about um, this, I've got the final project posted. I went ahead and posted it as it was. I was thinking about being, this is back to the, the idea of, of uh, triage, of, of keeping things reasonable. This is a final project I usually do and I know it and I like it. I was thinking about being really creative and out of the box and doing something special. And then I said, no man, you gotta, gotta get a grip on reality here. Stick with what you know. So the final project's posted there. I'm not gonna introduce it right now because I wanna get into the material, but it's there for you to read and I'll probably introduce it on Thursday, uh, discuss it a little bit. It's pretty straightforward, but it's worth having a few minutes to introduce. Uh, we're going to get into central limit theorem today, and then the other stuff that's in here is really just uh, about that idea. The, the big thing that I'm hamstrung by today with respect to the um, central limit theorem is, oh, I didn't start at the beginning. I was halfway through that. There we go. The thing that's hamstringing me a little bit right now is that um, I'm 
I'm, I'm used to doing this in class with worksheets and mass participation. And I thought about doing it with people who were signed in to Zoom, but it's usually about half a dozen people on Zoom. Like today we've got five. And so I didn't think we could actually do it very well like that. And plus it would just be a little bit awkward to try and do it uh, online compared to what I normally do in class, which is have one shared screen and then everybody works independently off that screen. So um, I'll walk us through a few of the examples, but you're gonna have to be a little creative in imagining what it might look like if multiple people did the same exercise. Uh, we do have some really great simulation tools here that uh, will help us with this. So I'll show, go ahead and fire that up right now. But let's get into the, the, the essentials of the central limit theorem. And I wanna pause for one more moment here. <laughs> just to say that the class so far has been very much about understanding broad contours of data and its uses. The next couple chapters are really about understanding the science of inference, and that is the mathematical ideas behind most social science studies, whether it's from psychology or um, micro, microeconomic methods or, uh, sociology, uh, geography, a whole bunch of social science disciplines all use these statistical inferential methods as their backbone. So it might seem that like we're getting beyond the ken of the, of the course in terms of why are we doing all this math stuff? I don't, what's, I don't see the point. Uh, it, it, the goal is not to understand all of the math. The goal is to understand the math well enough to understand when someone says that a result is statistically significant or not, what they're talking about, what they mean when they say, oh, I, you know, I've, I've, I've used science and it's statistically significant. So that term comes, comes out a lot, it gets bandied around a lot, but we don't always know what it means. The goal here is to get an understanding of what we're talking about when we, uh, when we say statistical significance, what, what, we're ta what we mean when we say that. So to get there, we need to talk about the central limit theorem, which is a really powerful mathematical observation to make about, about samples and, and sampling characteristics. Um, I have to give a little acknowledgement here to Steph Curry, and I know LeBron James is actually the, the uh, basketball player referenced in the, uh, in the title, in the chapter, but uh, I, have to, I have to give my own little respect for Steph Curry, because I think he's a, a really exceptional player. And, yeah, I know, maybe it gets plenty of credit, but still not all the credit he deserves, maybe. Anyway, uh, we sometimes have a debate in class when I bring that up. Everyone says, oh, Steph Curry this, and LeBron James that. And it's okay, you can, you can have your own wrong opinion about who's better. <laughs> so let's get into this. When we talk about a random sample and a population the random sample is drawn from, we have a few things that we can observe about that. If we know about a population, we can predict a lot about the characteristics of a random sample. And I'm gonna to go to my uh, Google Sheets database that we used for assignment one, where we had a whole long list of ages, of, of people's ages. So here is a big list of people's ages. We've got, oh boy, so many go all the way to the end just for fun. There are 654, um, 651 minus a couple, so about 650 people in this population. And we're gonna call it a population because we're imagining that it's the universe of this particular group we're talking about. It's not a sample, we're saying this is uh, the 650 students that are all attending this community college, let's say. So we have all their ages. We know these are all the students who are there. We're not missing anybody, although there's some missing data where people didn't put their age in the survey. So those ages are missing in that regard. But this is the entire population of this school. With that in mind, then we've got um, this distribution, which we see just eyeballing it. We can see that it has a mean value someplace, not quite to the median, but someplace probably around 20 something. I'm just eyeballing this. I don't remember what it actually was, right? If I just say, actually, I think I just had that at the end here, didn't I? Yeah, the mean value is 21.87. So I already calculated that here. So we can, we can take a quick look. The mean value is 
12.9 almost. The median is 19. We get a really quick, quick snapshot of the whole population there. When we take the central limit theorem, the first observation we make to get to the central limit theorem is if we know about a population, we can predict a lot about the characteristics of a random sample taken from that population. So in other words, I know the population has a mean of 21.9. I know it has a, uh, a, uh, a median of 19. And I say, hey, I just took 20 students at random out of this school and I put them into a new data and discourse class. Do I have some kind of an idea about the characteristics of my students? Can I make, if, if, I, if I'm told that I got 20 students at random from this population, can I make a guess about what the average age of my class is? Somebody in the chat, go ahead and take a stab at it. Or by voice if you want. Okay, so I should, I, could, I should assume they're 21 was the chat comment and, uh, or around 21 if we want to be a little bit wiggly on that, right? Because we have a 21.87, so it could be a little higher, they could be a little lower, but they're going to be around 21.9. In other words, if I know the population mean, I can know a lot about a random sample from that. Here's a random sample taken from that population. I came up with a, a mean value of 24. Here's a random sample of 50. I came up with a mean value of 22. Uh, why am I, why are my means so high? That's not 100. That's why. There we go. That's 100. Oh, something. I don't know what happened with my, um, with my sampling frame on this. Oh, that was 100. Um, I don't know what happened here. I'm going to erase these because they got messed up someplace along the way. Uh, but I'm going to say random sample of 20 mean. And I'm going to just do this randomly. What I have this sheet set up for here is you can select column A and column B. And these are random numbers that are generated just by the the uh, spreadsheet program. And I can go to data and I can sort by column A and it'll give me a new random sample every time and I can do that again and again. And what I can say is I can say equals average. So if it's randomly sorted, I can take the ages from B2 to B21, which is 20. Since it's inclusive and I get 21.8. <laughs> <laughs> Almost exactly. Uh, but if I do it again, why am I doing that? Oh, I didn't have it selected. There we go. If I do it again, I get a mean of 23.7. If I do it again, I get a mean of 19.75. If I do it again, I get a mean of 25.8. So we can tell right away if I got a group that had a few older individuals in it, a group that had a few younger individuals in it. But on average, I expect the group to be around 21 or 22 years old because that's the average age of everyone in the school, 21.5, 20.6, 21.35, 21.1. So we've seen a few that are fairly high compared to our average, a few that are a little low compared to our average, but pretty much in the 20, low 20 somethings right around our mean. That's what we mean when we say, if we know about a population, we can predict a lot about the characteristics of a random sample. We can look at this population histogram and say, I'm likely to get a lot of 18, 19, 20 year olds, 21 year olds. I'm not likely to get a bunch of 40 and 50 year olds in my class, maybe some, but it's not likely. So I know a lot about a, the characteristics of a random sample because if I know the population, I know what it's made up of, right? If I have a sufficiently large random sample, we can tell a lot about the population. And that is to say, if I take a random sample of 20, we see a lot of variation. But let's get up here to 
100. And we'll go B2 to B 101. And what I find then is I get 21.5. I'm going to sort my data again. So I'm going to do another random sample of 100. So I got 21.5, 22.8, 23.5. Sort it again, 23.6, 20.87, Yeah, okay, I'm just making sure I had 100 in there. Um, oh, I'm not, I'm not doing that, I can't do it again and again. Did I just do the whole sheet? No, I did the right thing. Okay, yeah, good. If I don't sort, if I sort the whole sheet, I mess it all up. 21.13, 22.29, 22.56, 21 21.45. What you should notice if you were paying attention to the numbers that we were getting with a random sample of 20 was we had more variation. We had more variance between the highs and the lows. There's more bouncing around of the mean compared to the actual mean. We get up to it taking 100. It's pretty consistent. We had some that were up towards 23. I think the lowest I saw was a low 21, but here's 22.05. It's almost exactly the same, right? One higher, um, half, half a year higher, um, almost exactly on the mean. So what we're saying is that with a large random sample, we know a lot about a population. We use this, by the way, when we get to polling. We, we do a poll. We, we try our best to get a random sample of whatever population we're trying to model whatever we're trying to um, understand the characteristics of the entire population. If we can get a thousand uh, people, uh, we can know a lot about even how a million people might vote, for example. Not exactly, but we know a lot about how they might um, vote or, or think about a particular public issue. All right. The, sorry, I have a question. Yeah, yeah no, that's great. Like when it comes to like voting patterns, for example, a thousand people, even, like, I don't even know if it's that good to represent a million since you have differences in state, differences between rural and urban, differences in socioeconomic status. There's a lot of factors that even a thousand people might not be a large enough sample to account for all of those things. So if you're, it depends on the question you're asking. And we're going to get there. I'm going to give you the short answer. The long answer is coming when we get to the chapter on polling, which is coming up, I think, chapter nine or ten. So... There's a little bit of hold that thought in my answer, but uh, the short answer is um, it depends on what you want to know. And so the, if you're talking about, say, differences within a, a population, so if you want to know with a high degree of confidence how um, rural voters will vote compared to urban voters will vote, or rural woman voters will co vote compared to rural male voters, right? Like the, you're splitting it into quarters that way, right? Then the smaller that group that you're trying to understand becomes, the less, um, the less certain you are about your error, the, the, the bigger your error bars become. And that's because it's much smaller than a thousand. So you're absolutely right. If you try and take a thousand people and then you say, oh, but what about, um, you know, White oh, so if you want over to, age 50, then you might only be looking at 40 in your sample. Yes, yeah, so if you want to know how rural voters in Arkansas vote, you wouldn't be taking a sampling from rural voters over in Washington or Oregon. Right, and that's the representativeness of it. That's, that's back to chapter seven, where you want to make sure that your, your sample represents the, the sample you're selecting, even if it's a random selection, that it's randomly selecting from the group you're interested in learning about. Otherwise, you're at risk of overgeneralizing. And so, so for that reason, we, we have a sample. Yeah. And, and, you, and when we do, we're going to get into, into this in more detail in polling, but when you do a poll, uh, we, we don't have a lot of state level polls on a lot of national is, it, it, issues because being precise in your polling is a challenge. It actually costs a lot of money to get a good random sample from any given population. And so a national level sample is actually relatively easy compared to a, uh, a state level sample just because there's more interest in national issues that really big, like Fox News or CBS will pay for those polls way before they're interested in like, what do people in Washington think about marijuana legalization, right? Mm. <laughs> 
So, so yeah, there, there's a little bit, I, I'm, I'm, as long as you're being careful to be random, a thousand does a lot on any given issue. But if you wanna, especially in the case you just raised, which is if you wanna break it down by groups within that, then you need to have a much larger sample so that those individual, what we call, if you think, imagine, you know, you divide it into rural and urban, then divide it again into uh, male and female, or divide it again into rural and urban and uh, bus commuters versus non-bus commuters, the smaller those individual cells get, uh, the more challenge you have towards generalizing them, is the general rule. Okay. Yeah, but yeah, really good question, I, and I, it, it's relevant to the, these these ideas too. So I want to make sure to address it. But we're going to go in more depth when we get to polling too. Okay, so this is now where we get into some interesting bits about uh, about the central limit theorem, which is this, and this is just the intuition. I haven't stated the central limit theorem yet. We're just building up to it, so don't worry. I just realized I wanted to use my uh, my little tablet whiteboard thingy and I don't have it plugged in, so let me plug it in. There we go, the happy sound of windows. Uh, if we know about a population and have a sample, we know we can tell how likely or unlikely that sample is taken from that population. So back to this histogram, if I tell you I have a class of 100 students and their average age is 35, do you think it's likely, if you knew the class was assigned to me randomly, so let's, let's pretend like there wasn't some kind of selection into my class, if I tell you my average class's age is 35 and I got the class randomly, they were just randomly selected from the school, do you think it's this school or do you think it's a different school? Wait, the what? So if I tell you, I got a class full of students, I got 25 students in my class, the average age of my class, the, the students all came into my class at random, and the average age is 35 years. Now, do you think those students in my class came from this school? Probably not. That has a, an average age of 21.9. No, no. Oh, no. People think no, right? <laughs> because 35 is way older than 21.9, right? So what we're saying, I'm gonna try and sketch some stuff on the whiteboard here. I had a little bit of whiteboard uh, failure the other time, but we're gonna, there we go, okay. So what we're saying is if I have a population like this and I take a bunch of samples, What I'm expecting is that I might see some variation where the sample looks like this or like this. So this would be a little bit older average, this would be a little bit younger average. This one might look a little bit more like that. But the fundamental characteristics of sample one, two, and three are gonna represent the, the population they came from. And then I come up here with it and I say, here's a new sample. And I show you a distribution that looks like this. Do you think it's a community college or a retirement home that I pulled the sample from? Retirement home. So what we're saying is that this doesn't look like that population. Although that does beg the question why a retirement home would have like 19 year old residents in it, unless you're counting staff. Well, this is our new sample. So the question I'm asking is I have, and so let's get back to this. Where's my, where's my, ah, mm, there it is. Get back to this. If we know about a population, so we know about the school, right? and we have a sample, we can tell how likely or unlikely the sample is to have been taken from that population. So in other words, we, have the we know about the college, and then we have this group of people, we say, is this group of people actually from this larger population, or is it some other population that it was taken from? 
the example that the examples that Whelan uses is, is you have a bus and you're on some kind of secret mission where you can't ask people where they're from, but you have to weigh them. <laughs> and and the idea is that if you have a whole busload of people who are lighter weight on average, then you're probably uh, sampling a bus of marathon runners, not a bus going to the gaming convention or a bus going to work, right? So the idea here is you look at the characteristics of your sample and say, this is from the population that I know, or if it's not, you say, this is different from the population I know. Or you can also use it to compare two samples in the same way. And when we do that, we look at it. So using that example, if you were to, in order to determine if your sample obviously does not come from your population, uh, would you have to know what the average of your population was to begin with? So you need to know the characteristics of the population or else you're just saying, wow, these, so just imagine this. If, if I just told you I had a class with an average age of 35, would you know whether it was representative or not of the larger population if you didn't know anything about the larger population? Nope. Right. So, so you need to know about the larger population before you test whether a sample is taken from it or not, right? Okay. And sometimes you don't know about it. Sometimes there's some populations that we don't actually know about because we haven't, there's no way we can possibly count every last one. But the, the, way, we, the way we infer what we do about very large populations that are, uh, that are so difficult to measure is through very careful, large samples. So for example, if I try and figure out how many babies are born in developing countries, there's not vital registries in a lot of these places where they try, they try to keep track of all the babies born, but a lot of babies are born at home, you know, in a village someplace, not in a hospital. Uh, and so how do we know the actual birth rate in a place like Tanzania or Chad? And the answer is, is that since we can't count all the babies, we do a random sample of households geographically across a wide area. And we go to the household and say, did you have a kid this year? And you do that several thousand times, and collectively you're like, well, of all the households we sa sampled randomly, this percent had a kid this year, and then you generalize up as long as your sample's random, that's pretty reliable. This uh, reminds so, me of your hidden woman figure or hidden girl figure from a couple classes ago. So that's um, that, it's a little different because that that relies on actual population observation. So there, those those countries where that data comes from, they do actually have a vital registry. They have records of everybody who has um, residence in the country. Maybe not perfect. I, I guarantee you, there's people living in India that aren't tracked by the Indian government. Um, but yes, you could do the same thing uh, exactly that way. Yes, okay. you could, you could um, go to every, every, you know, every household and say, how many kids do you have, right? And individually, people would say, well, I have one son, or I have two sons and one daughter. And then collectively, you build up a demographic profile, and you're like, wow, there's more families that have more, more sons and daughters. And, and collectively, that would add up to that inferential conclusion of missing women. Yes. That, 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 did we get through that okay? Okay? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay. So, um, why aren't I, sorry, clear, there we go. I was trying to clear this and it wasn't working. So back to, I wanna, I need to, I, sorry, I wanna make sure I'm on, on my, yeah. So the fourth point of random sample versus a population is we can compare two samples in the same way. Uh, and so if we know that two samples are random, this part's important, right? So if, if there's, back to chapter seven, if there was some kind of a sampling bias going on that biased our sample, then comparing them is impossible because they're not random, they're not representative. But if we have two random samples and uh, one looks like this and one looks like this, we can say, are these the same? Are they representing the same population? population or are they different populations? And the two I drew are obviously quite different because one's in, if we're looking at age here, this is quite young and this is quite old, right? But we can also do it with a pretty well-defined population, like let's say of 
21 years and then another one of 35 years. And we say, wow, you know, there's a lot of people here even younger than 21 and not many here even comparatively around 21 and a lot of really older people here compared to this sample. So we're able to compare these two, right? But on the other hand, if I gave you a sample, oops, if I told you one sample had a 22 year mean and another sample had a 21.5 year mean, would we conclude that they're dramatically different? What do you all think? <laughs> Is sample two gonna be a lot younger? I think everyone's just saying no. These are pretty comparable. So that gives us a lot of power to tell whether things are more alike than not, or maybe they're different. And we're interested in figuring out differences when we can, because we can't always measure everybody. Let's talk now about the central limit theorem and the, I'm gonna, I've been going slowly through this. I wanna talk about the big ideas behind all this because the stuff we've gone through should be fairly intuitive. If you've been wondering like, how is this math or how is this hard, then that's good. <laughs> if you've been just sort of keeping up, that's okay. It should be intuitive, the ideas of, a group of people taken from a population randomly represents a lot about that population, right? Uh, so now we get into a little bit more of the brass tacks about where we get the central limit theorem from, from and why it's so powerful. Any sample has a mean. We've been talking about that throughout all these examples. I've been running the mean of different sample sizes and talking about this idea that there's a mean to every sample. However, what we haven't gotten to yet is this idea of a numerous repeated sample means. So one mean is taken from one sample and then collectively we get multiple means and we can keep sampling, keep sampling, keep sampling. And the more often we do that, the more means we have. If you imagine we can graph those means. This is the exercise I used to do in class and it's really hard to do but I wanna walk you through the idea here and I'm gonna show you a visualization that shows this thing. We're gonna talk about the distribution of sample means and how it's normally distributed no matter what the underlying population looks like. To visualize what I'm talking about with sample means, I'm gonna to go to the second set of age data I had. This is over a thousand people. Um, I've got them randomized the same way here in column A and then their ages here are in column B. If you recall, the population had a mean age of just over 35. That's why that number popped in my head uh, just a little while ago with that, uh, that class size. This is a uh, population of people who took part in a survey I conducted online a few years ago as part of my dissertation, dissertation research. We're gonna consider this the population of Tim's survey. <laughs> it's not representative, by the way. It's not a random sample, it's people who um, who, who signed up for the survey. So I didn't, I didn't pretend like the population was generalizable when I did my research. Uh, but there is this uh, group of people, and we're gonna call them the population, and we're gonna take random samples from this population. Remember that we came into this with the idea that if we take a random sample from a population, there should be characteristics of the sample shared by the population it was taken from. And here I've got three, four different histograms each with a different sample size. If you look at the top left corner of each histogram, you see that there is a number of samples taken from this entire column B. So we've got N equals 10, N equals 20, N equals 30, and N equals 100. What you should be able to appreciate right away, and there's a mean value, right? So this is the average of these. So there's, um, there's three got drawn from the, looks like 21 year old column here, one 25 year old, one 28, one two 29 year olds. So you take all 10 of these people, add up their ages and divide by 10s, so you get a, a mean age of 30.6. If 
here you've got a mean age of 34.1 from these 20 people, a mean age of 37.4 from these 30 people, and a mean age of 35.9. I'm gonna just keep things simpler here. Good enough. Uh, 35.9 from our sample of 100 people taken randomly. First thing you should notice right away is that a larger sample size, the distribution of your sample looks much more like your population distribution. That should be pretty intuitive, but this really shows that, right? You can see how this doesn't look that much like the population distribution. Yes, there are more individuals from the lower end, just like there's more individuals in the lower end here, but it doesn't look a whole lot like this. This doesn't give me a whole feeling of that either, but here we start seeing a little bit more when N gets up around 30, and then we really see it here around N equals 100, where there's a peak in the 20s to 30s, and then a fall off, but a long tail out towards the 50s and 60s, and we see that a little bit more here. So what I wanna do though, is just go through a bunch of these iterations and sort this data on, why is it saying on column A? I don't wanna sort on column A. Ah, there we go. Hmm, okay. I'm gonna sort the range. No, no, ah, what did I do? <laughs> I, I, I swear I had this set up so it worked just fine. It was like magic and now it all fell apart. <laughs> oh no. Ah. Control Z should be undo. Yeah, but I'm trying to figure out what messed it up. Oh, you know what happened? Yeah, the histograms won't reshuffle, will they? Although, did they? I swear I had it working. It's a hot mess. I think the I think the um, the reference. Um, Well, I don't, did the did the bucket size just change? Is that what happened? That doesn't seem right either, though. There's something there's something really wacky going on here. <sighs> yeah, and this isn't right either. Oh no! no, no. <laughs> Has anybody figured out what I was doing wrong yet? I figured it out. I was sorting by age. So the age is ordered from oldest person to youngest person now. And the time before I sorted it from youngest to oldest. Were you trying to sort by column B or by column A? You, I, I need to sort by column A, that's the random data, so. Oh, it's because you selected B first and then panned over. Yes, that's why, okay. Boy, I'm glad I figured that out. I couldn't figure out what was going wrong. So now, this worked. <laughs> no wonder that was so goofy. Uh, operator errors. And there's no computer smarter than uh, smarter than I am dumb. So uh, it's hard to fix all my mistakes. Here we've got another sample of 10. And again, we see this generally representing this, but not exactly representing this. What we see is that the means, there's a, this is a sample mean, this is a sample mean, this is a sample mean, this is a sample mean. I'm gonna do a bunch of iterations. I want you to look at the sample mean associated with n equals 10. So we got 34.4. Keep in mind the, um, the actual mean of this population is almost 36. So we're a little low here. We're gonna do it again. We got 35.7, again, 34, again, 40, again, 35.8, again, 35, 37.2, 36.6, 35.6, 26.4, very low, right? Uh, 35.7, almost exactly right. 34, 35, 37, 33. Now what I had students do in class was work in teams, but everybody on the team had a separate one of these averages to chart. 
And what they did was they is clear. Everybody had a sheet of graph paper and they would graph out on their chart. And I told them this, the mean was right around 35. And every time they got a, uh, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Sorry, I've yes. got a, for some yeah. reason, my, my, my screen is flashing a, a mute um, signal. It's freaking me out. Okay, I'm gonna try to ignore it, but it's like right in my, it's like the big mute button keeps popping up in the middle of my screen. <laughs> what is Persevere? Um, we're almost done. So what we do is we'd fill in a block on the graph if we got a 35, and then we got like a 26, right? So I go the way down here to 26, and I fill in a block there, and then we had a 34, we'd fill on that block, or that'd be 33, and then it'd be 34, we'd fill on that block. And then if we got another 35, we'd fill on this block. And then if there was a 38, we'd go over here and fill it in, and so on and so on. And we did it for like 20 minutes. So like 100 times or 120 times. And eventually what you'd see is you'd see a distribution where there were more blocks right around the mean. It was a little lumpy, but you'd end up with this really sort of like, chunky still bell curve with long tails because there'd be an occasional block out like this so the blocks it was just a it was just a bar graph of all these blocks but it was cool because you could start seeing that most samples came from somewhat close to the mean a 34 35 a 36 a few samples came from a little farther away from the mean and very few samples came from these extreme ends so we, like we had 140 already and we had one like 26 already right so the more I do it, the more I fill this in. I want to do the same sort of exercise just in our heads, but by looking at, now I want us to focus on, where'd it go, there it is, on n equals 100. Now remember our, our actual mean value is, uh, third, oh, I figured it out, there we go, okay. I have, I have so much stuff on my desktop here because I got my mouse and my little trackpad thingy and my keyboard and I moved the keyboard into my remote control for the monitor and that's what gave me the mute button signal on my monitor, which isn't, yeah, okay. Problem solved. Not, not that you all were too worried about it, I'm sure. But keep your eye on this mean now of, of n equals 100. Now remember visually, n equals 100 random sample looks a lot more like the actual population. So intuitively, we should be reason then that it's more representative of the mean as well. I wanna see if that observation is confirmed here by these observations of our means. What, what does the mean do as we do repeated random samples of 100? So I'm gonna sort by column A, A to Z, um, 35.09, close, within one, right? 35.11, thirty five point one one, thirty six point two, thirty three point four, thirty five. Did it not sort? I didn't see it change, but maybe thirty six point zero zero, thirty six point three. 34.3, 35.95, which would be a 36 if we round it up, 36.6, almost a 37. So 36. the higher your sample count, the less variation there is in the sampling. That's exactly right. 35.22, 36.49, 36.66, I don't need to do this 80 more times, I hope, everybody. We good? Let me go back to the whiteboard and Guy, your observation was exactly right. If I was in the group that was doing this, but my job was not to graph out the sample means of, this is n equals 10, it's n equals 100. There's 35, there's my bucket for 35. I would start having a 
Now this is not graph paper, I recognize that, which is why this is so sloppy. I could do a much neater job if I was actually doing this on graph paper. Did we get any 37s? Not for 100. We have one that would have rounded up to 100 though, to 37 though, right? I'm gonna put one out there, you get the idea. There might've been one down here at 33, I don't remember, right? But what you see is that you're gonna get a distribution that looks like this. As a matter of fact, the people who are doing N equals 100 get kind of bored because they don't have to look all over their page for where to put it next to like, it's either gonna be 34, 35, or 36. Like it's not nearly as challenging as like counting out your numbers on this N equals 10. So the N equals 10 people, we have to do it 100 times to fill in their graph so it even looks somewhat like a bell curve. But people who are doing N equals 100 get a nice bell curve almost right away. It's quite peaky, but it's still a bell curve because it's even. So back to this idea of sample means, each one of these things that we graphed is a sample mean. So we did repeated random samples from the population. We did it again and again and again and again. When we graph the sample means, what we end up with is a normal distribution of sample means, even though, is the population we're considering normally distributed? No. Um, no. It's not. That's the beauty of the central limit theorem. The central limit theorem tells us that if we take enough random samples from a population, by the way, no matter how small the random samples are, if we take enough, the samples are randomly distributed. The sample means are randomly dis distributed around the actual population mean. The, the per, per guy's point, if we, do a, if we do a small sample, they're really widely distributed around the sample mean but they're still normally distributed. If we take a really large sample, relatively speaking, they get more tightly concentrated around that sample mean. That's incredibly powerful because what it tells us is it doesn't matter what the population's distribution is, we still know a lot about the mean from a sample. I'm gonna take what I just, just describing to you and do it with this, we can't do it in real life very easily, but we can do it right here. And we can start this sampling distribution thing right here. So here's a nice normal distribution, and I can do an animated sample of five, and I can graph the mean for n equals five right here. So what this looks like is here's one sample of five, there's one mean. There's one more sample of five, there's another mean. There's one more sample of five. So let me, let me, um, let me, do, let me do that over because so I can really explain. Here's five random samples taken from uh, a random sample of five taken from this population. This is their mean. We filled in one cube on that graph. We did it again. There's another sample mean. The blue is a sample mean. We did it again. I wonder if I can bigify this. Uh, I cannot bigify that. All right. I can do it again. There's, we've done three sample means, graphed them. We've graphed four. We've got five. Now we could sit and plus, plus animated and watch this for hours, or I can cheat and just do five at once, five different samples with five sample means. Do it again. So now we're at about 15. There's about 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50. What you start seeing here, there's a little bit of lumpiness because five is an incredibly, ridiculously small sample size to be used, right? but I can do 10,000 samples from this population with n equals five. <gasps> and it starts looking like a normal distribution. In other words, even a ridiculously small sample size like n equals five gives me a normal distribution with the mean of that distribution of sample means centered on the actual population distribution. If I change this to n equals 25, so we're gonna do the same thing again here, but I'm gonna take five here and put it down, and I'll take 25 from here randomly and put it down on this one. And 
and I'll do five of those. One thing we notice right away is that with a sample size of 25, we're much more clustered around the mean right away. If I do that 10,000 times, I have a normal distribution with a much narrower base than my n equals five. Back to this part in italics, no matter the distribution of the population, the cool thing about this simulation is I can take this and I can make something look like our classroom data, really young population, right? With only a few old people. Everyone see what I did there? I made the population have more younger people, very few older people. And I can take a random sample from that population. Here I'm taking five and graphing one sample mean here, taking 25, graphing one sample mean down here. And you should appreciate right away how much more 25 as a random sample looks like the parent population than five did, right? I can do that five times, 10 times, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50, 50, 50 60, 65, 70, 70, 75, 80, 85, 90, 95, 100. What we start seeing, this is still looking kind of messy, but it's getting there. This is rapidly approaching a normal distribution around the actual population mean that I drew here. And I can click much faster than I can talk. So let me just. It seems like once you get to 100, the more you click by five, it doesn't really change the general shape anymore. What you should notice is this little divot here should start filling in. And this little divot right here should start filling in just through randomness. Yeah, I'm talking about on the, the 25. The 25 Maybe. is not changing radically at all. You're right. Let's do 10,000 though, right? Or we could even do 100,000 reps. <laughs> so now we get a nice bell curve. Now, this might have a little bit of a long tail on it because it's such a skewed distribution. But n equals 5 is a ridiculously small um, sample size, which is wh what's going on with that. If we did another 100,000, it might start leveling out a little bit. As a matter of fact, I can still see little changes happening in n equals 5 there. Uh, Guy, your observations, I, I think, dead on, which is that n equals 25 really stabilizes much faster, right? It's, it, it tells us the power of a, of a more representative sample. If you ever read a, a scientific study that, that tries to draw inferential statistics with a sample size of, of less than 10, <laughs> forget about it. Even 10 is terrible. <laughs> so, uh, but the point of these really small numbers is so we can actually see the process unfolding. So uh, I can even go with something really dramatic like a, um, a custom distribution where I've got a bimodal population. So this is a retirement community where there's a bunch of old people and then um, workers and their kids, but nobody in the, the, the age, uh, say, um, 30, to 40, 30 to 50 set, or maybe 40 to 50, 60 set, something like that. Let's just say that, or uh, it's a college town and we've got some people in the middle of the population, but a lot of students and a lot of older professors. That's a, that's a good example too, right? So we've got college town population, not just students and not just older people, but mostly students and older people. So we can do five times, let's, let's just start piling these up. What you notice about a really small sample size is that if you pull five at random, you might have three from here and two from over here. That's going to give you a, a sample way over on this end. You might have three from here and two from over here. That's going to give you a sample way over here. Uh, but then the 25 starts being more reliable right away. And let's just go ahead and go whole hog and do 100,000. Again, we get a nice bell curve. In both cases, this one with a bigger variance or a bigger standard deviation. This one with a much um, tighter distribution. But in both cases, normally distributed around the mean of the population. Everyone see that the, the mean of the population here is 14.63 on this scale. It goes from zero to 32. Um, the mean on this is 14.63. The mean on this is 14.63. So we've gotten a normal distribution that is exactly the same mean as the population is by doing repeated samples. 
this is much wider and this one's much narrower in terms of its the, the width of the distribution but each one are are equally precise about estimating the the mean value so what does all this mean any questions really quick about that before i move on okay um, oh i got a wow in the chat um, okay so we've talked about this a couple different ways but let's rehash what we've learned one is that larger sample sizes and more samples so if we can't this is important to think about if you can't get a large sample size but you have a way of getting a small sample size randomly you can do multiple small samples as a substitute right there might be a consideration in social science where that's the best you can do uh, so larger sample sizes and more samples or if you can do large samples and lots of them um, gives you a closer approximation to the population mean because of that more compact distribution, that less variance in the distribution. So all things being equal, taking a sample size of 100 is more powerful for estimating the mean than is taking a sample size of 20. The standard deviation is a term we use to measure the distribution of a population. The standard error is the standard deviation of sample means. So it's a special standard deviation. If we talk about it with respect to here, the standard deviation here is 9.17. That's the standard deviation of this really bimodal distribution. Here the standard deviation is 4.08. Here the standard deviation is 1.83. But this standard deviation that I'm highlighting, this, I realize this is a little bit small maybe on some of your screens. Uh, but this standard deviation I'm highlighting right here is not the standard deviation of the population. It's the standard deviation of the sample means. So we took 100,000 samples from this population. And what we see is that their average spread has a standard deviation of 4.08. I, I did, oh. Average spread is, a is an easy way of saying the complicated thing that standard deviation represents. Go Does ahead. That, mean that the more uh, samples you take, the tighter that standard error becomes because they'll be bringing in the uh, distribution more closer? You're, you're, you're onto something, but in the wrong way. Um, what we see is that the larger your sample size, the tighter your standard error. So you, so you, said, you, said, the, you said the right version of it earlier when you, when you observed right when we were doing the samples of 100, mm -hmm. you observed right away that there's less variation in each sample, sample mean when you have sample sizes larger, right? Yeah. So that's what we see here, which is you can, if I asked you which, which one of these graphs has a larger standard deviation, you'd say the one on the top here, right? The yeah. blue one on top. So then the standard deviation isn't affected by how many times you run the sample, just how that's large exactly it right. is. Well, maybe, or maybe um, at the margin it might, but here we'll do it really quick. So we'll do five. And we've got a standard deviation that's quite low here, but even lower there. Mm -hmm. But if we keep doing that, what you'll see is that that standard deviation of the sample means, which is what we call the standard error, will converge on the same number, regardless of how many trials we do after. So let's do 10,000. We got four, four here and a little less than two there. And we can do 100,000 more, and it doesn't change okay. much at all. Does okay. that make sense? Yeah. So what we're saying is that the standard, the standard error is actually fairly robust to the number of samples you take, where the graphic might look really messy, but it, the, the variation we're going to get in sampling means is a function of the sample size. But it's not influenced by how many times you it's take not. a sample. That's right. It's a function of the sample size. So in other words, you don't need to do, if you know the sample size, and if you know the standard deviation of your population, you can count the standard error that's likely yeah. from any given sample size. Cool, thank you. Yeah, um, where we go? Okay, uh, so the standard error is the standard deviation of sample means. Uh, the way we calculate that is by the standard deviation of the population divided by the square root of the sample size. So I just said that actually in answer to your question, which is hilarious So we got there. We converged on this next bullet point perfectly. Uh, the way we calculate the standard error is by the population standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. What that tells us is that a population, actually I've got it all written out here. 
if we have a larger sample, um, then we have small, larger sample size, we have a smaller standard error. So all things being equal, we wanna have a larger sample size. It's better to take 100 random, uh, randomly sample 100 uh, cases from a population than it is to randomly sample 20. Uh, smaller samples means larger standard errors. That's the opposite of that, right? So we're gonna, if we take five, we're gonna have this really big standard error. And more dispersed population is a larger standard error. I just showed that here. This is a very dispersed population. So there's gonna be larger standard errors. And let's just, let's put a pin in this one. And uh, let me see if I can do it over here. I'm gonna try and see, I think I can keep this window open and not destroy that one. Yes, I think I can. Um, so this population has a standard deviation of five. This population has a standard deviation of 9.17, so much more dispersed. So what we'd anticipate following this rule, a more dispersed population so that S is bigger, has a larger standard error, and a less dispersed population should have a smaller standard error. So this less dispersed population should have smaller standard errors, both for n equals five and n equals 25. And we'll do, we'll go right to 10,000. What we observe is yes, the standard error for even a very ridiculously small sample size is small. And the standard error for a larger sample size is smaller than the same sample sizes for a more dispersed population. Let's take all this and, and wind it back to what we were discussing in terms of the, the very start of this, which is if we have a sample taken randomly from a population, it tells us something about the population it was taken from. Applying that here, if we have a sample of five from this population, we might get a sample over here. We might get a sample over here. We're most likely to get a sample someplace in the middle, but our ability to tell something about this population at the top based on, like the mean uh, is what we're specifically trying to tell about it, based on a, um, a, a sample size of five is pretty imprecise. We might get a value of like, your, our scale goes from zero to 32 and our mean is at 14, but we're very likely, we're as likely to get a, uh, a 16 or 17 as we are to get a 10 or an 11 right? We're only slightly more likely to get a 14. Whereas if we take 25 out, we're very likely to get a 13, 14, or 15, actually probably a 14, 15, or 16 is most likely. So we're likely to tell that this population is actually a, uh, has a mean of 14.6, whereas we, we're not as confident with a sample size of five. That's what it's telling us, right? Uh, and so the larger sample is better for that. And then also, if we have a population that's really widespread that limits our ability to be precise, even with a large sample. In other words, comparing this bottom graph here, we are pretty sure that the population is somewhere around 16 on average. And we might get once in a while a sample that's as low as say, what is that? Is that 16? That's 14. Um, or as high as, um, 18, but rarely, most of our samples will be right around that sample mean. And then in contrast, we see here, we're actually much more likely to get a 13 or a 19 from this population because it's more widespread. So what we're saying is that the characteristics of the population uh, influence the precision with which we can estimate uh, the, the population mean based on a sample, and then the size of the sample matters with, with, with respect to the precision with which we can estimate the population mean. And that's the standard error in what it's measuring. If the S over square root of N is freaking you out, don't worry, we don't have to do this math, but this is the discussion that's important about this, is that as S gets bigger, that's a more dispersed population, we have larger standard errors, or as N gets bigger, then we end up with smaller standard errors. This is the same thing we just did um, with the visualization, but in the Whelan book. And I put it in here just to say this is what Whelan is talking about because when, when people read sample means, they don't think about what each one of these represents. Each one of these represents a separate random sample, 
is what we're saying. This is not a population. This is um, 100 different samples all mean and their means are graphed here. Now again, these are a little messy because we've got a small sample size here. N equals 20 is relatively small. So we get some outliers in means here. When we get up to N equals 100, we get less so, right? And then when we have a subset of the population, then we end up with a much more um, clearly defined smaller standard error distribution. To put it back in the language we just used, a less dispersed population will have smaller standard errors. You can see that graphically here because the distribution of sample means for a female population only, as opposed to biological males and females, which is a more dispersed population in terms of weights, has a narrower distribution, therefore less variation in sample means. Why this all matters, and this is the, the final bit, uh, why this all matters is we know a lot about the characteristics of a normal distribution. In particular, one of the first things we learned in our class feels like it was only eight years ago. <laughs> one of the early things we learned in our class is that the characteristics of a standard of a um, normal distribution are that if we go plus or minus two standard errors above and below the sample, the mean, we know that there's that's 95% of that curve is within uh, two standard deviations of the of this of the um, central estimate the mean if we look at the frequency distribution of sample means we know the same thing because as we just demonstrated sample means from any population are always normally distributed so we know with probabilistic uh, certainty how likely or unlikely a sample is to be from a population or not in other words, if, and I don't know if I can, can I annotate on this screen using, ooh, I don't think, I really want to just annotate the screen, but that's okay. We'll do, we'll, we'll do it really quick. And then I need to wrap this up because it always takes an hour, no matter what I'm doing. So back to this standard deviation here. If I told you that my population was 36 and you knew that the standard error of a sample of 100 was, um, let's say, just to make it a round number, one, uh, then you could go two above and two below, and that would be 38. So that's two standard errors. So the standard error of my, of my estimate is, is one. Uh, it's 38 down to 34. So that's, minus two SD plus two. Now, by the way, I use standard deviation and standard errors pretty interchangeably, but the, the best term here is standard error because we're talking about the distribution of sample means. And I say, okay, so I've got a, a, a population with a mean of 36. I know the standard error of a sample of 100 is one year. And so that means that I'm going to have 95% of my samples will be between age 34 and 38. So then I come along and I say, hey, I got a group that's 40. It doesn't tell you with certainty, but this is where inference comes in, and we'll start this on Thursday. What it tells you is it says, well, I'm 95% sure that my range of ages should be between 34 and 38. You just came out with, with 40. I'm going to say it's not from that population because there's a low probability of it being from that population. So that's at the heart of inference. And I want to really leave it there for now because it's a lot to stew on and think mm -hmm. about. It's a little counter, oh, what did I just share? Did I share my whole screen? Could you also infer that that person's sample mean was cherry picked to bring about a particular value? 
Um, well, you don't know, you don't know the process that happened. What, what, oh, I'm sharing the whole screen. There we go. Okay. This is better. Uh, so you wouldn't want to draw that conclusion anymore. You want to draw, draw the conclusion that it was, um, it was representative, but you just want to say, I think that there is, a, here, here's the way you put it statistically is you'd say, um, I expect 95% of samples to be within 34 and 38. This sample is 40. So therefore I think something's going on. Yeah. Okay. Now, whether it's selection bias or whether it's space aliens, as, as really careful, skeptical scientists, we're agnostic to. Now, people assume all the time that it's for the reason they think it is, but it could just be random chance too, right? Because statistically speaking, we're still gonna, even, even if there's nothing going on, we're still gonna have occasional cases that are out here in the wings, right? Because sooner or later, you flip a coin 10 times, it comes up all heads if you flip the coin enough times. Mm -hmm. So we're going we're gonna to end up with sample means that are outliers, but we're just saying it's improbable to have that result. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it there without much more discussion about it because I can tell there's a lot going on already in this chapter, and I want to really focus on what the central limit theorem tells us, which is that we know a lot about the population mean based on a large random sample from that, that population. So let's wrap all this up, put a bow on it, call it and call it a good a good day um, a large random sample mean will distribute normally around the population mean so we've we've done that a few different ways now which is if i take 100 random ages from the bag of all ages i end up with those 100 ages have a mean that is very close to the actual population mean right and the further away my sample gets the less likely it is to to occur so i get a few that are one or two years away I get a lot that are half a year and, and less um, away from the, uh, the sample. So that's always a normal distribution. That's beautiful. Um, that's a key insight in mathematics about, about the way samples work. Um, so therefore, because they always distribute normally, therefore most sample means are within a known distance of the true mean. We call that known distance the standard error. So we, we use that standard error to say how how exact we are with a given sample size and a given population's distribution. The central limit theorem tells us that probability that a sample mean is within some distance of this, of the, of this population mean. So in other words, if I tell you the population mean is 35.8 and you give me, uh, I can tell you that it's very likely to be within 36 and, um, and 34, right? Or 37 and 34, it's less likely to be higher than that, less, li less likely to be lower than that. But it's not just a general, well, we know that farther away is harder. The central limit theorem allows us to put a quantifiable mathematic probabilistic estimate about how likely or unlikely each result is. Again, the point of this class is to make it about understanding the the mathematical thinking behind this, not actually doing the computation. If you, if you get into a stats class, they run you right into the, uh, I think stats classes are getting better about this, but a lot of stats classes just run you right into the t-test without really explaining what's going on. And this class is meant to go the other way around, which is like, if you wanna go do the math, have at it, but understanding the principle is way more important uh, for, for, for me and the people who actually designed this class before I even started teaching it, so. Uh, the less likely the chance of a sample mean being the same as the population of the mean. So in other words, we have a, we have a, a probabilistic estimate of how likely a, sam a given sample is to be taken from that population, the farther away we get. So the more like we have a 40 sample of a, take, you know, the more likely we have a, a I need to slow down. <laughs> Back to the earlier example I gave, if we have a sample mean of 40 from a sample size of 100 and the population mean is 36, I can use the central limit theorem and my knowledge about the population and the sample size to say that is really different than I would have expected from a random sample of 100. I think something is going on here. And then this is a concluding point that we're gonna get into on Thursday. The greater chance that something significant is different about the sample. So when we say statistical significance, this is what we're saying. We're saying 
the likelihood of that having occurred by chance is outside what I would consider to be a normal likelihood or an ordinary likelihood. That is what we mean by significance, is that the event we just observed, the sample we just measured, is someplace over here or someplace over here in the tails of the distribution, not someplace in here. If we test something and say we didn't find any significant results, we're saying the sample mean of whatever we were observing was someplace in here. In other words, very predictable. When we say something is significant, that's different about it, we're saying it's over here or it's over here. It's unusual or improbable. That's a good spot to, to leave it. And uh, I, I, I will close the recording. I'll stay here for anybody who has questions or whatever else. Um, but where is my, there we go. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to say goodbye to everybody who's been listening, um, in terms of, uh, watching the recording and I'll, I'll hang out for a minute if people have questions or chat or whatever else. Thanks very much, everyone.